This evening we're going to continue Psalm 119, which uh, gives to us, again, a series of reasons why the psalmist loved the law of God and wanted to obey Him because of all the blessings that basically accrued to Him through it. So let me uh, read for you the portion we're going to look at this evening. And again, uh, I'm hoping that um, you know, this will be more, have more of a devotional tone, although it's hard to, um, you know, not, not to see the, the things this calls us to do. But I hope we'll find it all, in, all this to be encouraging. So Psalm 119, I'd like to read uh, verses 41 through 48. Now, the psalmist uh, prays this. May your loving kindnesses also come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. So I will have an answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in your word. And do not take the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I wait for your ordinances. So I will keep your law continually forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty for I seek your precepts. I will also speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be ashamed. I shall delight in your commandments, which I love, and I shall lift up my hands to your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. I hope if there's one thing that comes across in the psalm is the fact the psalmist loved God's law. And again, we're going to see one of the reasons this evening why he did. Now, I would like to just briefly tie it into what we saw this morning, because this morning we were exhorted, uh, encouraged by the author to the Hebrews to run a race, a race that's set before us, a race which, if we're to run it um, efficiently and successfully, that there are certain things we need to set aside. We need to set aside the sin that so easily entangles us, that binds us up, and we're going to see that Basically, uh, Christ sets us free from sin so that we can walk at liberty. But we also saw that we need to set aside those things that may not necessarily be sin, but things that can still slow us down, things that can still weigh us down, things that draw our, or divide our hearts and draw our affections in different directions so that we can't focus on what it is the Lord calls us to do. And what He calls us to do is to live consistently for Him, uh, running the race is just simply another way of talking, uh, of saying that we are to obey the Lord's commandments because the commandments tell us how to run the race. Uh, we were exhorted this morning or encouraged to run it in the way that our Lord Jesus did, no matter what the cost may be to us, just as Jesus did for us. Remember, He ran that race so that we might be saved so that we might be able to run the race as well for Him, so that we might actually be able to make it to heaven. And our Lord tells us that that's what we need to do. We do need to run this race. We do need to fix our eyes on Christ if we are going to arrive in heaven. But again, understanding that from the right perspective, that we don't uh, arrive in heaven because we run the race, but we run the race, we do these things because we've trusted in Christ, because He's had mercy on us, because His mercy and His grace transforms our lives. As we saw again this morning, God will make sure that we do arrive in heaven. He'll make sure that we do run that race. He'll make sure that we do the things that He calls us to do in His commandments if we are trusting His Son. Repentance is evidence that we have truly been born again of God. Now, again, what the author said this morning is really no different than what the psalmist is telling us this evening as he encourages us also to obey the Lord, just simply another way of saying the same thing. God's standards, God's morals, what He desires for our lives really never changes. The standard has always been the same, as well as the benefits in obeying the standard and keeping them. He's already told us obedience brings blessing as we were reminded in our call to worship. Blessed are those who walk in the Lord's ways. We've also seen that it brings moral purities. How can a young man or an old man or a young man or woman keep their ways pure? By keeping it according to God's Word. We understand that obeying the Lord in the context of this world <clears throat> will bring persecution. But even that is a blessing, our Lord tells us. 
Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. One of the things that might um, actually make us not want to sign up and go door to door is the fact that some people may not like what, we, what we're doing. Uh, they may not like to be disturbed, especially by Christians who are inviting them to some kind of a Christian activity to try to bring them to repentance and faith. But if we should be ridiculed, if we should be re reproached, uh, we're actually blessed, Jesus says, to be able to stand in His place and take that abuse that is actually meant for Him. So yes, obeying the Lord can bring persecution, but even that, our Lord tells us, is a blessing. And we know that on several occasions, Paul basically rejoiced in the fact that he could suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is the right attitude to have. We've seen that the law can bring personal revival. It can show us our sins and cause us to seek the Lord. It can show us what it is that really matters in this life, which is not the things of this life, not the vain things of the world, but rather the things that are eternal. Those are the things that are really important, the things that, that the heroes of the faith, Hebrews chapter 11, had their eyes fixed on as, as they left this world and sought after the kingdom of God. Now, this evening, we're going to want to see that uh, the law of God can also bring personal transformation. It not only shows us our sins so that we seek God for revival, but it, it also is able to give us the blueprint of how it is that God wants us to live. And when we live that way, it can bring a powerful testimony to the truth of the gospel. The, the gospel is not to come in word only, but also in power, and not just power in persuasive speech, but the power of a godly life. It's one of the things that made Whitfield so powerful, Spurgeon so powerful, the Apostle Paul is what they were willing to endure and, and how it transfer, uh, transformed their lives for the glory of God. Well, the law of God is the blueprint for that. Now, as the psalmist did before, he again does now. He asks God for something that only God can give. Remember when he was asking for personal revival, he was praying to the Lord and making petitions that he knew only God can answer. Reformation, revival, uh, the, this personal transformation is not something that we can just decide to do and do it, turning over a new leaf. It's something we need God's power for. And so that's what the psalmist prays for. He prays for God's loving kindnesses. May your loving kindnesses also come to me, O Lord. Those loving kindnesses are God's mercies, the things that are only available to those that trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the things that He will only give to those who were His, uh, those particular mercies He gives sovereignly when and where He wills, but gives usually in answers to prayer. Now, what was the psalmist asking for here? Well, maybe he was asking for what we saw him asking for a couple of weeks ago, that the Lord would remove the false way from him, that he would no longer go astray, but rather that God would grant that he could walk in his ways. Or maybe what we saw last week, that God would turn his eyes away from looking at vanity, at the things of this world, which so many people desire, but at the end of the day, really are worthless. Because even if you gain all that the world has to give, at the, you know, when you're standing before God, it's going to mean nothing. It may mean worse than that. It may actually condemn you if that's what your life was all about. So maybe he's, he's asking that, turn my eyes away from vanity and revive me in your ways. Actually, both of those petitions are essentially the same thing. And the petitions that we need to be praying every single day, that the Lord would turn our eyes away from the worthless things of the world to the things that really matter. So what is it that he's asking for? Well, he actually tells us in verse 41. Your salvation according to your word. Now, what does he mean by that? Is he saying, I'm not saved, Lord, please save me? I, I don't think so because the psalmist couldn't have the heart or the attitude that he has as he writes this if he didn't already know the Lord. I don't think he's talking about that. Maybe he's referring to salvation from a particular enemy that was um, attacking him in some way. That's possible. 
or he may have been referring uh, uh, to basically the salvation from that particular enemy that we all have to face, the ultimate enemy of our souls, something we still have to battle with as Christians, and that is sin. Remember this morning, the author to the Hebrews was telling us that we need to resist sin. We need to resist it like Jesus Christ did, even to the shedding of our blood in our striving against sin. That's the kind of effort that we should put into it. I believe the psalmist here desires the same thing and is asking that the Lord would save him from those sins that he deals with. Now, what does the psalmist hope to gain by this request in particular? Well, it appears that his desire is to be a better testimony for the Lord in verse 42. You know, grant to me these loving kindnesses, your salvation according to your word, so that I will have an answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in your word. Now, I think one of the things, one of the, one of the downsides, especially to a believer of sin, is that sin will bring on you reproach. It will bring criticism from others, especially from unbelievers. When they know that you're a Christian, unbelievers love it when Christians sin because it gives them an excuse not only for their own sin, but it also gives them an excuse to criticize you and call you a hypocrite and gives them an excuse not to believe the gospel. Now, you know what a shame it is when somebody you've been trying to witness to sees you doing something that's wrong and you realize that you've just damaged your testimony and not only that, but given them a reason not to believe. But what would happen if you would pray this and the Lord would grant you this mercy, that you might be able to live a blameless life? Now, we realize that we can't do anything in this world perfectly. You know, every day we sin in thought, word, and in deed. But I do believe that our imperfections, the imperfections the Lord tells us will be in our obedience, is really going to be more inwardly than outwardly. It's not that we're not going to, you know, or that we're going to live, let's say, an outwardly perfect life. But our, our uh, imperfection, our weakness should really be more within than without. In other words, I think it should be more in our motives than in our actions. And the reason I say that is this, because even in our imperfection, which we will experience on this side of heaven, unbelievers should be able to look at us, and they should be able to see Christ in us. They should see someone who outwardly is living like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why would I say that? Well, think about what it is that the unbelievers called the disciples at Antioch. They called them Christians. You know, that wasn't a name. I've said this before. They, Christians didn't call themselves Christians, kind of like Puritans never came up with the name Puritans and called themselves Puritans. And pietists, I don't think, called themselves pietists. All of these things were really terms of ridicule and meant to be a reproach. Well, why did the unbelievers call the disciples Christians at Antioch? It's because they saw in them Christ. They saw that they were living like the Lord Jesus Christ, and so they called them, oh, you're little Christ, I see. Well, that's actually a good thing. They saw that they were living like Jesus Christ, and I believe that the Lord will give us the power to live like Him. Now, if you can live like that, if you can live like Christ, then you will have an answer for those who criticize you. You will have the answer of a good life. I think it's perhaps the most powerful argument that you can bring to the reality of the gospel. We all like to argue, you know, uh, give arguments for the truth of the gospel, and there's certainly a lot of value in, in doing that. Uh, Peter tells us we always, at all times, be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies in us with gentleness and reverence. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, it's a simple matter of a testimony. Other times it might be philosophical arguments uh, for God's existence to strip away the hypocrisy, as it were, of the unbeliever who says that he doesn't believe in God, though he really does. But really, this is probably the most powerful argument for the truth and the power of the gospel. That is that it can transform lives. It can actually, as we're going to see in a moment, set us free 
from what everybody else in the world is actually a prisoner to, and that is sin. But when you can say, although not as perfectly as Jesus could say, if I've done something wrong, then point it out. Bear witness to the wrong. Show me. See, that's the kind of life we should be able to live. If somebody brings a charge against us, that it would be a false charge. This is the kind of life that silences our opponents. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2.15, For such is the will of God, that by doing right you might silence the ignorance of foolish men. Again, the point is that we're to be Christians not just in our words, but we're to be Christians in our lives, and that produces a very powerful testimony to the reality of the gospel. Now, I think that might be behind his next petition in verse 43 where he says, and do not take the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I wait for your ordinances. You see, he wants to tell others about God's truth, but he knows that if his life undercuts it, he won't be able to do that. If you live an ungodly life like the rest of the world around you and then you try to tell them about Jesus Christ, they're just going to laugh at you. It's going to make the words that come out of your mouth basically fall to the ground. But when you combine the gospel with a blameless life, you have an argument that the enemy can't refute. It really does silence them and gives you the opportunity to tell them what it is that makes the difference. Now, as the psalmist thinks about that particular benefit, as well as all the benefits of obeying the Lord, he comes to a resolution. Sounds like something Jonathan Edwards would do, but something that we all ought to do. His resolution is in verse 44. So I will keep your law continually, forever and ever. I hope as you're seeing the benefits of obeying the commandments of God, then you'll see even more uh, how ridiculous the idea is that this is simply the, the words of a man who is seeking to justify himself under an old covenant, which was a covenant of works. That is not true. This was a covenant of grace, even as the new covenant is, only the new covenant is much more gracious, as we saw this morning. This is the heart of a redeemed man who desire to honor his Lord through a blameless life. Now, if you obey the Lord, you will be blessed. You will be happy, certainly much happier than you would be if you didn't obey for the reasons we've already seen, as well as the fact that he's given us this evening that this will make you a powerful witness to the reality, to the truth of God and of his gospel. This is the reason why he saved you. This is your purpose in life, and that is to be a witness to him. Now, we often talk about the fact that we should obey the Lord because we love Him. This is how we show ourselves that we love Him. I mean, it's a testimony to us when we see ourselves obeying the Lord because we love Him, but it's also a testimony to the world that we love Him. And can you think of a much better reason than that to obey the Lord in that you testify of His grace and of His mercy and of His truthfulness and of His reality and of His power? in your life to those who need to hear the gospel. That's a very important reason for following the Lord and obeying Him. Now, the reason that obedience makes your witness so powerful is that it does stand out. It, makes, it sets you apart because it's so different from what the world does. Now, I realize we look around and we can't seem to distinguish the Christians from the non-Christians. That's the way it is today, but it shouldn't be that way. Christians should be living a distinctly different kind of life. I think you would see that in Christ, wouldn't you, if He were walking among us today and doing what it is His Father had given Him to do in His obedience. I think you would see He stands out. Well, we should be standing out as well. It shows when we do this that something different is going on in us, something supernatural, something that really only the Spirit of God can do. What it shows is that He has set you free from what you were once a prisoner to, which is sin, and that which would have sent you to hell. Notice the psalmist writes in verse 45, I will walk at liberty, for I seek 
your precepts. I will walk at liberty, he says. Now, you know when you come into the world, you come into the world as a slave of sin. But through the gospel, Jesus sets you free from sin. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You no longer have to sin. You have a choice now that you didn't have before. Now, the funny thing is, Christians are the ones who are free. But when the world looks at a Christian and sees a Christian obeying, they think the Christian is the one who's actually in prison. The world looks at, at itself as being enlightened. The world looks at itself as being free because we're not bound to these strict rules that uh, the, the Bible imposes upon Christians. They're the ones who believe they're free. But the fact is, it's just the other way around. We're the ones who are free. They're the ones who are bound and are prisoners of sin. And they actually find that out from time to time when they try to stop sinning because they can't do it. Or if they do happen to shut off one, they simply turn on another because they are bound to sin. They are prisoners of sin and they cannot help but sin. But Jesus set you free from sin. You don't have to sin, at least Again, outwardly, there's still going to be that imperfection. You're not perfect. You're still going to have imperfect motives, imperfect goals. But you are no longer absolutely bound in sin and nature's night, as it were. As um, Charles Wesley reminds us, you know, God, the, he diffused the quickening ray by his Holy Spirit. He changed our hearts and he gave us the ability to obey. We are free from sin. And we can obey, we can do what's right, we can do what is pleasing to God. Now the psalmist rejoices in the fact that he has that liberty. And that's something you should rejoice in as well because it not only means that God has saved you from your sins, that one of the evidences that you are redeemed is that you are no longer bound in sin. You don't have to submit to it. You're no longer a slave to it. So it not only shows that you are a true believer, but it also makes you a powerful testimony to the saving power and truth of the gospel. Now again, the world, at least for the most part, isn't going to like that witness. And again, they're going to look at you as I mentioned, but God is going to use that testimony to bring those in darkness to himself. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light shine, that is your obedience to him, in such a way that they, that is, unbelievers, may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. This is what it means to walk at liberty, to be free from sin, to walk in obedience, that you might be a light, that you might be a powerful testimony to the world. Now, it's interesting that the psalmist goes on to talk about the fact that this liberty can also give you a greater boldness in, in your witness, a kind of boldness that a life of sin or at least compromise, can't give you. A, a boldness even to stand in front of those who may be the most intimidating people in the world. He says in verse 46, I will also speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be ashamed. Now we think about going door to door and perhaps we're intimidated by that. And those people don't have any authority over us. They can't hurt us. All they can do maybe is make fun of us or ridicule us at most, maybe curse at us or whatever, but they don't have this kind of authority, the authority of kings. You know, freedom from sin can bring a kind of boldness that will give us greater courage so that not only will we not be afraid of what maybe what these people would say, but even the kind of boldness that it would take to stand before those in authority, to stand before kings. It brings a measure of freedom from fear. It brings a holy kind of boldness, a courage that grows from righteousness. And that, not just a greater power of the Holy Spirit, as Paul reminded Timothy, God has not given us the spirit of timidity, but He's given us the spirit of power and of love and of discipline. I don't think that that's exactly what the author is referring to here, or the psalmist, but I think he's talking about the power of a good conscience, a clear conscience. Because what is the power that the enemy has over us, after all, uh, when he wants to intimidate us, but he accuses us of the sins that we're very much guilty.
guilty of. The enemy usually throws everything in our faces, everything we've done wrong to try to intimidate us and make us feel ashamed and to make us feel like hypocrites when we go and try to tell somebody else they need to repent and live for Christ. But when you obey, when you walk at liberty and freedom from your sins, not only is the assurance that your sins have been pardoned strengthened, but Satan actually has less material to accuse you with so that you will find it easier to speak and you'll have more boldness to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. Liberty and freedom from sin brings boldness and courage in your testimony because it takes the bite out of what Satan has to say and what your flesh would also accuse you of. I think that's a very important point. Liberty from sin, freedom from sin, walking in obedience will give you greater boldness to testify. It will not only make your, your own personal life more powerful, but it will also give you more power in your testimony. Now, realizing these additional benefits, the psalmist again looks at God's law and he rejoices in it. He extols it in verses 47 and 48. I shall delight in your commandments, which I love. And I shall lift up my hands to your commandments, which I love. And I will meditate on your statutes. Now, again, considering all these blessings that the commandments or obedience brings, this is how the psalmist views the law of God. And this is how you and I should view it as well. I mean, the psalmist actually is, is expressing an act of worship towards the commandments. I shall lift up my hands to your commandments. I mean, how could he do that? Well, again, realize that he's not talking about commandments written on stone. It's not like he set up the stone tablets and he's worshiping the stone tablets. The Lord was very careful to make sure that he didn't give, you know, too many visible, tangible things to the Israelites because he knows of man's propensity toward idolatry. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, that, that bronze serpent that was set up in the wilderness that the Lord told Moses to make so that those people who were stung by the serpents could just look at it and they'd be healed if they believed God's promise. They actually eventually took that serpent and set it up as something to worship because man's heart is idolatrous. Well, that's not what the, the psalmist is expressing here. He's not wanting to worship stone tablets. He's worshiping God because the commandments are really an expression of the holy character of God they're basically a part of God Himself. When He worships God's standard, He's worshiping God. And that's what you do as well. When you listen to what He says, when you see the character of God, when you know what it is He wants from you, and you submit to it and you obey it. Remember, worship is to be with our whole lives. It's not to be just a compartmentalized you know, meeting or two on Sunday or during the week, but all of life is to be worship, and the way that we worship the Lord is by submitting to His commandments at all times, because when we do that, we are loving God, we are loving our neighbor, we are running the race, we are advancing the kingdom, we are displaying the truth of the gospel. All of these things really boil down to obedience. Again, I'm reminded of what Jonathan Edwards said. The obedience of the Christian is the most powerful testimony to unbelievers that the gospel is true, but it's also the most powerful evidence that God has to give to the, to the demons to show that we have been delivered from the kingdom of darkness. He knows that, Satan knows that, that he's lost us when he sees us obeying the Lord. It, we shouldn't underestimate the power of this witness and how important it is that we obey the Lord. And so in closing, let me just simply ask these questions to help each one of us because all of us have room for improvement. We all need to grow. Is this your heart? Is this what you do? Do you delight in the commandments? Do you love the commandments? Or do you basically see the commandments as sort of getting in the way of what it is you really want to do? Well, if that's the case, you need to repent 
and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you need that new birth where the Lord writes His commandments on your heart and gives you a love for them. But now if you say that you love these commandments, does your life really bear out that you do? Are you keeping them? I mean, are you really keeping them? If your life were, again, put on trial, would, would there be the evidence of obedience to prove that you are a believer, or do you just simply know about them and maybe approve of them in your mind, but they never really work themselves out in your life? Well, again, the blessing only comes from the obedience, and the evidence is the obedience uh, that we have been born again. The, the testimony is the obedience. It's not just the knowing and agreeing with what God's Word says, but it's the actual doing. Remember, to know and not do is, is really the height of folly. And James tells us, you know, that we really shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord. If we look at the law of God and we see our blemishes and we walk away unchanged, we're not going to benefit from it at all. As a matter of fact, it shows that we, again, really don't know Him. We do need to obey, and that is what God gives us through the gospel. That's why Jesus Christ came into the world, to obey and to die, so that we would be given the power to do these things, so that our lives would be transformed. We're not talking about a, a, you know, a standard of works that we have to obey to be saved. We're talking about the evidence that we are saved. And again, if you really do love the commandments of God, then are you meditating on them as the psalmist said that he himself does? Because if they're able to bring such blessings as the psalmist talks about, if they're able to stop the mouths of God's enemies and take away any accusations they may have, at least truthful ones, if they're able to provide the evidence that you have been set free from sin, from your slavery to sin, and give you a boldness to witness, then there's something that are certainly worth meditating on so that you can keep them more carefully. May the Lord give us grace as we continue to look at this, really this grand devotion on the commandments of God. Uh, may He give us grace through the Lord Jesus Christ to see more and more of their value and to love them and to delight in them and to meditate on them. But especially, may He give us grace to do them. Well, let's... Uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord would grant us that mercy, that we would, as we've seen again a little bit more of what they're able to do for us, that we would be encouraged to put more effort into obeying the Lord.